Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Inertia Device. Uh, You have a nerdy word. Yeah, so I have kind of a nerdy word to talk about today, in that this word didn't really exist in English until it was kind of co-opted by Johannes Kepler. Oh, okay. Chief nerd in charge. Chief. Um, And it it has a Latin root, but it, it was only used in Latin, and it has a particularly... You know what, I'm going to stop preempting myself and tell you what the word is. Okay. That's probably a plan, isn't it? So the word that I am talking about in this particular case is inertia. I-N-E-R-T-I-A. Nice. And the reason that I... The reason I got interested in this word is because I have started to learn about biomechanics. And one of the things that is is a bit of a hurdle for me to get over in terms of self-study of biomechanics is that I have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of physics. None. Hmm. I just had an education that didn't really include a great deal of physics. Certainly not the kind of mechanical forces side of physics that's very important to the study of biomechanics. (laughs) Right. So quickly we got on to inertia, which I had sort of assumed was just a word for something being still. Right. So the ve- the first citation of it in the OED comes from Isaac Newton in Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Ooh. You know, everyone's got one of those on their shelf. That old chestnut. Page turner, if ever I saw. And of course, uh, this this word is this word. Excuse me. This citation is a Latin citation. So we have materiae vis incita is potentia resins resistendi, neque defert quicquam ab inertia masse. And then shortly after that, 1706, I say shortly, not that shortly, in <laughs> Philip's New World of Words, we have vis incita materia or vis inertiae is the bare power of resistance only, by which every body endeavours to continue in that state in which it is, either of rest or motion. Right. And... As I've been learning about biomechanics and as I've been getting to grips with these concepts that are kind of unfamiliar to me, I've learned that inertia is about taking something that is still and causing it to move. And the amount of force that's required to take that still thing and move it is measured as inertia. And the amount of force that's, t- you know, to take a moving thing and stop it, that, that also kind of comes into it, which is which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah. It's also generally used to mean something that doesn't move. So we have figurative sense of the the word used from 1843, the inertia of a massive civilization, or indeed a government. Right. Not that I could possibly be talking about anything happening in the real world right now. No. Definitely not. No. Um, So inertia itself, it comes from a Latin root. And what's interesting is that it's a special sense of this Latin word, because the Latin word inertia has nothing to do with motion directly. It means unskillfulness, ignorance, inactivity, or idleness. Oh. Unskilled or inactive. Huh. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah. You can see that this word has this meaning has kind of come back, but it's come back via a figurative sense of a very clearly defined scientific usage of a word that meant the figurative thing to begin with. Yeah. I thought you were so, going to say that unskilled and inactive kind of also definitely doesn't apply to any current affairs or politics going on globally. Oh, no. I, I couldn't possibly comment on that. No. Definitely not. <laughs> so inertia, with that, that prefix in, and then the the pi root that gives us the, the form of the word is ar. And this particular pi root means to fit something together. Hmm. So something that is inert is not fitted together or a person who is incapable of fitting things together. And this gives us some really, really interesting cognates. 
So this root R forms all or part of Adorn, Alarm, Aristarchy, Aristo and Aristocracy, oh. Arm, as in the upper limb of the body, Arm, as in a weapon, Armada, right. Armadillo, Armament, Armature, Armilla, Armistice, Armoire, Armour, Armoury, Army, Art, a skill as a result of learning or practice, oh. as Etym Online defines it. Right. Arthralgia, arthritis, arthroarthropod, arthroscopy, all those arthro words. Article, articulate, artifact, artifice, artisan, artist. Coordination, disarm, mm. gendarme, harmony, inert and inertia. Inordinate, ordain, order, ordinal, ordinance, ordinary, ordinate, ordinance. <laughs> ornament, ornate, primordial, subordinate and suborn. Neat. It's amazing all the things that have this sense of fitting together in the yeah. meaning. And what I'm most amazed at is, you know, usually when you look at a list of, of cognates from a pirate, you find really quite widely divergent meanings, widely divergent paths that, that words have taken. Um, but but with, with almost all of these, I can kind of see, oh yeah, I, I understand where that sense of fitting together has come from, and I can perceive that within the current modern meaning of that word. Yeah. So it's like the little pirate that could. You know, it's <laughs> it's very small. You, you would almost miss it if you didn't look hard for it. But it, its meaning is pretty stable when you consider the, the number of cognates that it has kind of brought about. That's so something that is inert isn't just still. It is, well... According to the Latin, it's it's lazy, it's useless. <laughs> it doesn't move because it is unskilled and incapable of doing important things. So, you know, it just kind of sits there like a blob. Huh. And then Kepler borrows it, introduces it into physics and gives it this very, very particular scientific nerd meaning. And then there's there's this sort of indefinable etymological force that kind of snatches it back and says, hang on, that's not what this word really means. What this word really means is something that is sluggish, slow, not responsive, not reacting, perhaps even, um, you know, not not negligent. The, the, the sense of kind of laziness, of not moving when you should because you just yeah. don't like to move. The kind of um, thing that so, when it appears on screen in a television show or movie, the, the, the music automatically turns to dum da dum da dum da do 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 da dum Yeah, like you need a trombone in there somewhere. Yeah. A trombone is the uh, the instrument of inertia, which is highly ironic considering how much movement is required to play the <laughs> <Right>. trombone. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was I was really interested to find that this, this etymology is kind of bounced back. Yeah. It wouldn't stay still. It wouldn't uh, it, it wouldn't stop moving. It, it's as though it asserted its original character from that Latin usage via the pirate to give us. And yeah, you know, as you say today, it was actually a few weeks ago that I researched this word. But today, given that my government is telling me to avoid social contact and work from home if possible, on the one hand, but it's also telling me that the school where I work is staying yeah, open. Right. Damn it! So. Off you go and stand and function in rooms full of 30 germ-carrying teenagers. Yeah. Jeez. Perhaps a certain inertia about yeah. that. Yeah. So, That's very cool. Inertia. I like, I mean, at the same time as it being kind of a thing that bounces around, there is a certain amount of inertia in the way it's developed from the pie root to current roots, like you say. Like, you can kind mm. of see it. Yeah, absolutely. Obstinately just meaning fitting together all the way through, so that the pirate itself Even is like, pretty like, inert as well, which is interesting. Yeah, I, th I think my favourite was armadillo. Yeah, my favourite cognate. I like that. You're like, yeah, of course. Armadillos look like they have been assembled by a not very skilled model maker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yet, and then the, the closer you look, you're like, oh, actually, this this design's pretty cool. It all fits together very well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, very, very interesting uh, list of, of cognates. That is very cool. And then, you know, all, all of the, the arthro stuff and re uh, referring to joints, which, of course, fit together. Yeah, like you think yeah, of an just, articulated I, I found it thing and it's got a the very joints. satisfying, uh, A very satisfying pie route to find that it's, as you say, quite inert, hasn't moved much, hasn't, hasn't changed or shifted or yeah. 
found itself along any kind of complicated paths. That's interesting. So very cool, and it's it. This is one of those things where the words kind of go together nicely because um, yours is fitting together and coming together, and mine is not, as you will see. But my word is device. Oh, nice. And so, you know, we think device now, the way you, the context is, I mean, let's be honest, the context is a parent telling their kids they don't get one anymore if they don't shape up. But <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, the reason I looked this up is I was, I'm reading through the Narnia books with my middle child, youngest son, Oliver, and we got in, we've gotten you know, to my favorite one. It's it's really, it's probably the only reason why I would consider ever having a child of my own, so that I could read stories like Narnia to my imagined progeny. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a good enough reason in isolation, which is why I don't have any kids, <laughs> but I do very, very much enjoy reading stories with uh, my, my friends' children and yeah. you know, anyone who'll let me, basically. It's a fun time. So I am a little bit envious that you... Uh, are have have gotten to your favourite Narnia book, uh, and is this second time around? Uh, with him, it's the first time around with him. No, no, I mean, did you read them with 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 Thomas too? Oh, we, yeah, we read them with Thomas, and he read he's read them a bunch of times because he just he's a voracious reader, so he's he'll, he'll because go you are like uh, you are winning as a parent. Yeah, yeah but uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, that that's all you need. Everything else is <laughs> secondary. Besides it all falls. He into loves play. Narnia, and he's re he's rereading those books. Yep, tick. It all falls into place after that. So we got, we've got we arrived at uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is oh, man. by far my favorite of the Narnian stories. And there's a point in there where they're... Um, brief recap. For some reason, I'm reticent to give spoilers to a book that was is like 65 years old or something. But um, there's a gold band that one of the characters, Eustace, puts around his arm. And it has an insignia on it that is important plot-wise to Don Treader. And when King Caspian, formerly of Prince Caspian, the title character of the previous book, Fame, notices it, what he says is, look at this, look at the device on the band. Mm, or something yes. like that. And so I was like, right, I had this vague thing, like the, the information behind that usage has been in my brain before, but it's not there now. You know, like that sort of echo very... of... It's a very Tolkien-esque sort of word, as far as I'm concerned. You know, yeah. I was interested to hear you say it's. You, you, we sort of think about it in terms of parents letting children have or not have a device, because that is not even the first, second, or probably third usage of that word that that my brain would get to. But then I am not currently denying children devices. <laughs> oh uh, yeah, exactly. Tomorrow, yeah, give give it twenty four hours, and I'll be uh, all about that shit. You'll be all about that. But no, I. I I really love this kind of elven, dwarf-made sort of sense of of that of that particular mm -hmm. word. So, it's yeah. cool. So that the this use of device as like an insignia or something is uh, first cited in the OED in 1375, Ooh. and it's uh, defined by the OED as an emblematic figure or design, especially one born or adopted by a particular person, family, etc. So like a heraldic. Logo, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This isn't the oldest use of device in the OED, uh, even though it is 1375, so it is quite old. Um, that one is a sense defined by the OED as being, quote, something devised or contrived for bringing about some end or result, an arrangement plan, scheme, Ooh. project, contrivance, an ingenious or clever expedient, often one of an underhanded or evil character, a plot, stratagem, or trick. And that dates back to 1290. Nice. And then... Um, so those who were making devices were deceiving? Yeah, just sort of scheming. And then very shortly after that, and so this is one of those things where... Hold the, on while I twirl my moustache. That's right. The, the citations are so close that it's clear, like clearly these were all concurrent uses. They just mm -hmm. happen to be written down in different orders, I, I would assume, because the earliest use of this one is 1303. So it's like 13 years later, you can assume that people were using it for a while before it got actually written down. But yeah, sure. this one was uh, the idea of will, pleasure, inclination, fancy, or desire, as in the phrase, left to her own devices. Uh -huh, so that okay. use of device. And that was goes back to Which hadn't occurred to me at all. Yeah, and that goes back to 1303. Uh, 1307, we get a different use, um, similar, but it's like 
something done at the will or desire of someone else. So you do something right. at her device. I'm writing sure. at his device, or I'm gardening at her device, or whatever. And then these are basically obsolete now. But sometimes they get brought, like when that phrase, left to her own devices, like that still mm. shows up. But it's definitely an archaic use. Um, Although it immediately puts uh, whatever the name is of that pet shop. In fact, the Pet Shop Boys song might be called Left to My Own Devices. Yeah, well, and we're coming up to another musical reference. So Ooh, another nice. archaic sense uh, dates back to 1400, so a bit later than that, the earlier ones. And it is the action of devising, contriving, or planning. And this one, and I, I read through some of the citations in the earlier quotations, and I kind of went, wait, I know this, I know this. And I sat and thought about it. And the probably the most frequently, if unconsciously referenced use of this archaic early 15th century sense of device is in the song Hotel California. Awesome. We are all just prisoners here of our own device. Of our own device, of course. And so, yeah, all of a sudden, uh, eagles bringing out their 15th century, early 15th century archaic <laughs> English knowledge. <laughs> That's amazing. Don Henley, you magnificent bastard, you. Um, you know, my, my favourite my favorite story ever about the Eagles was that they, uh, they wanted to be a rock and roll band. <laughs> and they were, they were like trying to, you know, tr trying to do sort of more conventional rock and roll type stuff. And managers and scouts, and they, they were just, just weren't really interested in it. And then they'd, they'd gone into a studio to do some recording. And... To sound check, they did this little you know, sort of close harmony skit that they would just kind of do for fun. And the manager, the guy in the studio was like, holy shit, do that. Yeah. That's what you should be doing. Do that. And it's like, oh, man, the Eagles wouldn't have been the Eagles had they not essentially just taken the piss a bit. <laughs> yeah. But I do always I do always like to think of um think of the Eagles, you know, rocking those beautiful close harmonies, thinking, God damn it, I just wanted to like shred a guitar. <laughs> yes, right. I just want to smash stuff on stage. None of this With intricate my 15th century work. vocab. Um Yeah, so they're they're going deeply back to their roots with Hotel California. Um <laughs> and then in also in fourteen hundred ish, which is how I translate the circa 1400 in most dictionaries. Um, oh, yeah. Circa means ish in yeah, my head. Yeah, it means ish. Um, we see a concrete use of device that sort of most closely resembles the modern use of like a gizmo to do a thing, which mm -hmm. is which the OED more scholarly defines it as the result of contriving something devised or framed by art or inventive power, especially a mechanical contrivance. So that yeah, there's a, there's a definite kind of, you know, the 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 automatons. Yeah. Like like Hugo, you, you know that the Scorsese movie where there's an automaton, and and cogs and kind of steampunk vibes. I, I always feel like device has that inherently. Yeah, yeah, de uh, the mechanical contrivance thing to do another thing, element of it is there. So etymologically, so the the thing that struck me about this was that these are all very. It's sort of related, but you can kind of trace a little thing. But they're they're weird, and that they're all at the same time. They're all within a hundred years. They've got these all these wildly different views, and we're not even getting into the fact that there is also the word, the verb, devise, which has been yeah, used in a couple of these, man. and it, that's all going around at the same time. So all the stuff is kind of roiling and boiling together in the 14th century, and. Etymologically, it doesn't actually get any neater because the OED basically says that this word device is the result of an old French word and an existing Middle English word kind of smashing together and becoming confused themselves Ooh. because one of them was D-E-V-I-S and one of them was D-E-V-I-S-E. -E, and they were alternately okay. like they were either pronounced with a voiced or unvoiced sound, either the device or device Sure. And and then they all all the senses kind of muddled together into this this one word, which itself the spelling of it obviously has changed over the centuries and was with an S or a C or a Y or an I or whatever. The I love how etymology does that. 
you kind of look like that guy. You're the same. <laughs> We're just going to smash you together and see what happens. Yeah. We just, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, when you're, when you're five and your parents take you somewhere and they're like, hey, there's another five-year-old who you've never met before and know nothing about. Go and play. <laughs> Some sort of social like, large uh, hadron collider. Screw you, but uh, okay, kind yeah. of. And then two hours later, you're like, yeah, this is my best friend. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're never, we're moving in. We're going to go tour Europe. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, yeah, so Edam Online tracks the words early meaning. I switched over to Edam Online because it was just a little bit neater than the OED was getting a little confused mm-hmm. and confusing and stuff. But the Edam Online tracks the words early meaning of intent, desire, a plan or design, and an expressed intent or desire. A literary composition was another early meaning that it, it cites. And it goes through the old French. Mm, yeah, de vie. like like that sort of, that sort of very highly stylized Chaucerian sort of, almost as much about structure as they are about content. That yeah. sort of device. But but also you you can talk about a device in terms of like a motif or a symbol. Yeah, yeah, or a a, a, a certain trademark artistic flair, like a literary device. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, for sure. And it goes through the old French devis, D-E-V-I-S, meaning division, separation, disposition, wish, or desire, and weirdly a coat of arms or emblem, a bequest in a will, the act of bequeathing. And so there you get, Mm -hmm. so this is why I kind of thought these fit together, because inertia from the putting stuff together, device from the division and separation, disposition. And so the... The bequest in a will, act of bequeathing from devise, D-E-V-I-S-E-R, meaning arrange, plan, or contrive, literally meaning to divide and distribute in portions, Mm -hmm. which comes from the vulgar Latin divisare, which is a frequentative of dividere, meaning to divide. So it all comes back to division. Um, And incidentally, that frequentative, which is something I hadn't... Again, it was one of those things where I think I might have known about it at some point, just like a vestigial echo of knowledge that no longer exists in my brain. But I, so I, I feel like up. the older I get, the more of my knowledge fits into that category. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh yeah, you, I've, I've seen you before. At Were you eaten? Point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a frequentative, for those who, like me, don't know or don't know anymore, is a word that describes a repeated action. And so it's a modified okay. form of another word. And the Wikipedia article gives some examples in English where it's often with the suffix L-E or E-R. So you get words right. like dabble from dab, flutter oh, from float, nice. dazzle from daze, patter from pat, sparkle from spark, or wrestle from rest, W-R-E-S-T. I, I want to go and make lots and lots and lots of, of these words. Yeah. If you so need me, I'll be sitting down somewhere with a dictionary because hopefully, <laughs> hopefully someone will actually close a school tomorrow and I won't have to go and be infected. <laughs> that's right. So you'll be there making up frequentatives. Yep. So yeah, that's... Up frequentatives. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting that device that has come to have such a concrete meaning has a bit of an amorphous um, mm. path to it and doesn't result in a lot of super concrete... Divided, you might say. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, that's device. And oh. I, I mean, I guess I don't I'm still confused by the the heraldric coat of arms use of. Devi. Well, I like, was actually just thinking that that, that, that one kind of makes sense to me because a, a heraldic device is essentially linked to, you know, the name of a house. And what names do is they divide people. They distinguish them from other people. Oh, I guess. OK. Like if, if everyone was called Ryan, then that would suck for you because you would never know who was talking who to you was when. Who, yeah. But if you were divided by being Ryan the Awesome, then your coat of arms would say, this is Ryan the Awesome. And okay. people would be like, oh yeah, I know that guy. I was kind of thinking He's more... He's not just one of the amorphous Ryans. Right. I was, the amorphous Ryans are a new indie rock band that I'm coming out with, by the way. Yeah, you're kind of imagining your own private army right now, aren't you? <laughs> I sure am. They're all shapeshifters. <laughs> Deal with it. Um... <laughs> I was sort of thinking the visual element of a coat of arms is usually like divided by mm, yeah. lineage or different comp- components of the family line or something. But I, yeah, I don't I know. I watched an episode of QI this week that had a question about heraldry and they had the, oh, I'm totally going to mash this title. It was like the, the 
chief sergeant at arms or something like that. Basically, the guy whose job is to look after heraldry in the UK. Right. You know, just all, all aspects of it, the kind of ultimate authority in, in heraldry. And they were talking about, God, I can't remember what the word was, but they were talking about um, what happened if you had more than one wife in your coat of arms. And, and basically it was just divided up. So if, if they, they were saying, oh, Henry of Henry VIII must have had a crazy uh, coat of arms because of all those wives. But um, it, it right. seems it was an optional thing. You didn't have to take it into account. But okay. this sense of, you know, basically you would cut the shield in half and then one half, the, the female half, would be divided up into as many parts as you saw fit to include. Man, Henry VIII would have looked like a damn kaleidoscope. Well, they, they showed an example of a really cool kaleidoscopy looking coat of arms because essentially you can divide it as many times as you like. So hmm. uh, I, I, I wonder I, if that's I where it comes from and, then. And, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I want to go back and find the, the, the word that they were talking about because it's obviously relevant to this conversation, but I cannot think of it. Hmm. Blame the coronavirus. It's making me crazy. I do. So... Yeah, but but yeah, divide, 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 divide. They were sort of saying, you know, there's no limit to the number of times that this section can be divided. That's cool. Um, so so you could essentially have... They, they made a coat of arms that kind of almost looked like a little photo mosaic. Okay. But, yeah. Nice. That's interesting. Well, if anyone out cool. there knows what the actual answer is and you're sitting here going, no, it's this. Uh, no, do idiots. email us. Do, Dear idiots. Do be in touch, Yeah. You know, I've been, I've Did been we pleasantly ever, uh... surprised by the fact that we haven't had to do a dear idiot section because we don't get a, we we got one we got one angry email when we got talking about we did yeah we got talking about acupuncture and someone was very disappointed that we were talking about uh, basically mumbo jumbo as she saw it and oh. I was like oh well. oh wow C- can I uh, can I make that person super duper angry with. Um, yeah, I'm there not... are so many aspects of modern anatomy that essentially vilify this notion that Chinese traditional medicine isn't really science. You know, it's it's not science as we see it. It's a completely different system of treating uh, ailments, physical and emotional. Yeah. And it's really, really incredibly complicated. Also, there are lots and lots and lots of things that these days scientists discover and go, oh my God, this thing's so cool. And traditional Chinese medicine practitioners are like, oh yeah, that same thing that we've been telling you for the past 10,000 years, cool. <laughs> Glad you finally so, caught uh, up. Yeah. yeah. I don't I'm, know that she's I'm still not in any way in the fine. mumbo jumbo acupuncture camp, not for one second. No. Also, I don't know if you've ever had acupuncture. I've only ever had acupuncture once, and it was when I lived in Korea, hmm. where, you know, there was an acupuncturist on every fucking corner. Right. <laughs> and which was great because I mean, it was super cheap. But I had hurt my shoulder and I was in a lot of pain. And I went to the acupuncturist, and it was as if they had located the switch that said pain on or off. So, um, yeah. Wow. I, I think that the, the whole concept of acupuncture is mumbo jumbo and nonsense is perhaps uh, coming from the a place of privilege of not ever having been in terrible pain. Yeah. Because, like, I, I don't know about you, but if I'm in terrible chronic pain, I don't really care if they use magic to fix it or not. Yes. Like, That's why I've never bring on the magic because that's what you've effect. got. <laughs> I will take a placebo yeah. effect if it works. It works. One hundred percent. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.